All right, so welcome to yet another session in our discipleship class. And we will start to read Acts chapter 8. I said we will start to read it, but we will not need to finish reading it. It says in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, it says, And Saul was consenting unto the death of Stephen. See, and Saul was consenting unto his death. From Acts chapter 7, we know the his there is Stephen. Saul was consenting unto his death. Saul at that time was an unbeliever. Never mind that he was a Pharisee. To the Christian faith, Saul was an unbeliever. So he was consenting to the death or the killing or the persecution of a Christian and therefore the church. So, question. What are the things we should never consent to? Being that, continuing now from his message about sanctification, being that we are different, we are separate, we are called unto the name of the Lord Jesus. What is it that will or must necessarily show that we are who we are? Paul here is consenting to something. What is it that we must not consent to because we are who we are. Now he also looked at Genesis chapter chapter 2 where he says that and God sanctified the seventh day. God sanctified the seventh day. And what was it that made the seventh day different? You see he's asking all those questions and in my mind I'm saying just go away, let me come and start preaching from where you have stopped. What was it that made the seventh day different? Because God did not walk that day. Eh? So God does not permit walk that day, being sanctified. We are sanctified in and through Christ. What is not permitted of us? Because we are in Christ. Are we good? What is not permitted of us? We are in Christ. What is not permitted of us being that we have been made separate, being that we have been set apart, being that we have been sanctified, what can we not permit? What can we not do? Because to do them or to engage in those things we amount to a violation of your sanctification. You want to do yourself. What is it that we cannot permit? Now, I'm not going to preach today. We will just read many scriptures together. So get ready with your reading, with your reading eyes. We need to know so we stop permitting the things which we should not permit. God rested on the seventh day. And from that moment to the whole of the Bible, Sabbath automatically refers to a special day. A day set apart for a certain behavior. No work. They were vexed with Jesus because he was healing the sick on the Sabbath. So he asked them, if your goat fall inside gutter on the Sabbath day, will you go away and come back tomorrow? Come and save your good. Will you not save your good right away? Is that not work? So if I heal the sick and you save your good, which one is more important? But they held the Sabbath so holy, they were ready to kill a man who healed the sick on the Sabbath. That is how important the difference of that day was to them. But Jesus now has become our Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath, and we are now in Him. So in Him, we have been made different, separate, special, set apart. So um, in every house, just like in the house of God, according to Paul in First Timothy, he said in every house there are different types of vessels, some unto honor, some unto dishonor. In every ordinary house, not house of God now, you and I are in our houses, we have special cup for stranger. We have special cup for houseboy level. I mean, 
we have special cup for daddy, special cup for mommy, special we have special plates, we have all those things. That's how it be for Africa. I don't know about the world that I never see. But that's how it be. That's how we grew up. You want to serve daddy, you are going to use his special plate and put it on the tray. That's how we were brought up. There are special vessels in every house. The broom you used to sweep outside is not the broom you used to sweep inside the house. We were trained like that. Even in body house, the cutlass you used to cut down tree. It's not the cutlass you are going to use to cut grass. If you try it, your hand will break if you use the cutlass of grass. Even if you use the tree grass, uh, cutlass to cut grass, you will struggle. It's too big for grass. The machete, that's for tree. The sinsimoni, this flat slim one that you can bend the mouth, that's for grass. Now the Bible says that we have been sanctified, made separate, different, just by the fact of being in Christ. What are those things that cannot be found with us because we are separate? For example, on the Sabbath day, you dare not walk in Israel. You will be tempted to have defiled this Sabbath. So if you see a Christian doing the things listed in the Bible as unchristian, then you know, is that this man is not a Christian or he's not serious? Because those things should not be found with Christians. All right, enough of that. So, number one, number one, we cannot be the ones persecuting or killing other Christians. Have we? Not necessarily. You can't be killing your brethren. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you are not going to see, Thou shalt not kill other Christians, but you are going to read something that will help you shape your behavior as a Christian. First Corinthians chapter 12. Are we there? All right. From verse 12. First Corinthians 12 from verse 12. Are you sleeping? First Corinthians 12 from verse 12. You see, when you actually put your face to read the Bible, it helps you to concentrate on what is being read. It helps. From verse 12. For as the body, that's this human body, for as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where were the smelling? But now has God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are there many members yet but one body he's still talking about the human body and the eye cannot say unto the hand i have no need of you nor again the head to the feet i have no need of you nay much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon this we bestow much more uh, much more abundant honor and our uncomely that is on beautiful parts have more abundant Comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, have no need, but God had tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacks. That there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Listen to verse 25 to 27. 
that there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God had said some in the church, first apostles, so read that one. From verse 25 to 27 is the point. What is this piece of scripture really referring to? The human body or the body of Christ? Is using the human body to explain the mind of God concerning the body of Christ. So if you understand as an individual human being that you are one member of the entire body of Christ, then understand that you cannot maltreat another member of the same body. So how can a Christian be found maltreating another Christian? That's why I read the whole thing. So we understand. You may not know which part of the body of Christ that you are as a one person, as an individual. Even your whole local assembly. You may not know what part of the body of Christ, for example, redeem. We don't know whether redeem now one small finger. The whole redeem that has maybe five million members all over the world. Maybe just the small finger. Maybe the church in Africa, like what my small one said, may just be the eyes of the entire body. And then the white or European church may be the torso, the chest region, like that. We don't know. Let's not speculate. But the point is, we are different parts of the same body. So, will my hand take knife and cut off his neck? It's not a normal behavior. If you do that, demons are talking to you. Telling you to destroy your body. And in psychiatry, we know that's possible. I've met a couple of them saying that they heard voices telling them to use both to tear their chest. I've met them. So it is not normal behavior for Christians to participate in the undoing of another part of the same body that they belong to, the body of Christ. Eh? We cannot be. Now, if you don't understand that general point, well, read verses 25 to 27 again. 25, it says, there should be no division. Division means you can't be saying you are this and I am this. We are the same body. Yes, the head may be the head and the hand may be the hand, but we are the same body. And if you must understand, the one central nervous system controls all parts of the body, except the pacemaker that is in the heart. That one has its own engine, it beats by itself. Even if the brain is dead, the pacemaker, the, the heart own, it will still be beating boom, 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 because he has his own built inside the heart muscle. That's why you see sometimes somebody is dead. Doctors have called him dead. If you open his chest, you will see his heart is still making go 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 for some time. Otherwise, all parts of the body are supplied by the same central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord and all the branches. Really. Every part of the body, human body is supplied by the same blood, manufactured from the spleen and the bone marrow or wherever supplied by the same blood. <clears throat> so if you take one drop of blood from my forehead or from my big toe, we send to the lab, they will essentially be the same. All the chemicals in the blood, any part is the same. Why? It's the same body. As the blood gets to you where you are, you take the one that you want. So the muscles will take more, if you are an athlete, the muscles will take more glucose because they need the energy to do your sports work. If you are a, if you be empty, your muscles will really work. You are sitting down, so your muscles will not necessarily take more. Instead, your brain will be taking all the glucose because he's the one walking. But that glucose is in the blood. Everybody is taking the one that he wants. If you are intestine, you take the one you want, you throw away the rest. After some hours, the man will go and. Uh -huh. You see what I'm saying? We are members of the same body. We cannot be seen to be causing harm to any other part of the body. That is for outsiders. He said, and Saul was consenting to the death of Stephen. And then he began the persecution of the church, as we know from scripture. You cannot join forces, especially with outsiders, to harass a Christian. Your brother. Your brother. You can't do that. You can't do that. 
to help me understand the point. One evening I was passing by Okwebi, in front of MTN office. Evening, and I saw some girls standing there, as we know. And I turned my face in disgust, and in my heart I said, hey, this uh, six thirty, I don't stand already. Six thirty, I'm not even going to wait for eight o'clock, nine o'clock. Six thirty, I don't stand. And the Lord began to speak to me. He said, Have I not told you not to, not to regard them in that light anymore? Really? He said, Okay, what if as you pass now, you see your sister, the biological sister, standing among them? Have you no get sister? I said, You know, I have them. He said, So what if you see her standing there? Will you drive past? Will you not stop the car and try your best to get her away from there? I said, Yes, sir. He said, Now the people that you are turning your face up for, he said, There are people that I died on the cross for. To me, they are clean. It is to you that they are unclean. They are clean to me. They are acceptable to me. I've died for them. I've washed them. I've forgiven them their sins. They are standing there because you have not done your work to go and tell them what I did for them. That's why they are still standing there. You have not told them. You have not done your work. Yet you are the one turning your face. And then he hit me with the killer. He said, if I bought them with my blood, where do you keep the thing where you take your precious money by? Where do you keep it? Not your house. He says, so that's how I see them. Just as much as that's how I see you. Two of you are members of my house. It's just that they have not come home because you have not told them I know the next again. So that they can come home. But to me, all of you are one because Christ died for all of you. Now, you see the thinking. He's, even, he's including people we call unbeliever in the matter. This is not what he told Peter. Yeah. Don't call unclean what I made clean. So why do we even call them unbelievers? Although that's what they are, they are, they never believe, so they are truly unbelievers. But you know when we call them unbelievers, that's not what we are talking about. We are disparaging, yes. We are dis dismissing them as unclean and all that. That's really what we are doing when we say unbeliever. Yet to God, that's not how he sees them. In fact, when an unbeliever dies, I know for a fact, because I've experienced it, Jesus is most probably weeping. Why? His death for that person was for nothing, it was in vain. It didn't avail for the person. Okay, I said I was not going to preach, but I have to explain. So if we understand how it is about our being members of the same body, and we'll see some other things that will further help us to understand this point, you cannot be the one damaging another Christian. Not to even talk of persecution or killing. You, can't, you shouldn't even be talking evil about another Christian because he's your brother. So the, the Lord was telling me, if you cannot do allow that with your sister, who is your biological sister, why do you allow that for somebody that I died for? Even if you never received Jesus. Somebody I died for, why would you talk like that about that person? You see, it should change our perspectives. Some of the reasons they are, they are not born again is because of our attitude. They see you come in, they know you, they look them like dirty. So if you like you preach down your gospel, they're not going to listen to you because they know in your heart, you know, Number one of the things that we must not be seen to be permitting or participating in is the destruction of another Christian. We are brethren. Eh? We are all of the household of God. We are all fellow citizens with the saints. If we are fellow citizens, the other Christian has the same rights, the same privileges, the same promises as you have. Now, in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it. So if you join them to, to persecute a Christian, you they do yourself. Because whatever that person is suffering, because we are all members of the same body, you are doing it to yourself also. You may not see the effect right away. But imagine that guy is killed, and now you're supposed to be done with the way we pay your picking school fees. What happens now? God has to now spend another 20 years looking for another new that good thing that will come and do you. I'm just talking this thing. That will come and do you that service.
All right, number two. Number two on the list of what we must not be part of or must not permit. Being that we are separate from the world, sanctified by Jesus Christ, there are certain things that must not be named among us. Number two, permitting or allowing the suffering of another Christian. Permitting or allowing the suffering of another Christian. Permitting or allowing the suffering of another Christian. If you understand that you are members of the same family, how can you let that happen? How can you let that happen? Because the person you are allowing to suffer is your brother or your sister. How can you let that happen? To help me understand the point, many years ago, again, using my biological family, that is my father's house, my brothers and sisters, God explained the point to me. He said, back in the day, in the university, when you saw your senior brother in Benin, did you turn your face away? No. You opened your house to him. You bought drinks for him. You fed him. Why? He is your brother. That's your biological brother. Now, the Christian is also your brother. If you behave like that towards your biological brother that time, what about your Christian brother now? And then he said, don't you understand that your Christian brother is more significant to you than your biological brother? There can be all kinds of reasons for that. Number one, the person who became a Christian is dead to that side. That's what the Bible says, he died. He said you are now members of the household of God. Can you be member of two households? But let's not get into that. The point is, if you understand that the other Christian is your brother, how can you allow your brother to suffer? Acts chapter 4, if you read towards the end, I'm going to give you several scriptures. But, okay, let's read Acts chapter 4, then I'll give you the other scriptures. Acts chapter 4, verses 33 to 35. Acts chapter 4. 33 to 35. Acts chapter 4, 33 to 35. It says, Acts 4, 33 to 35. It says, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Verse 20, 34. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of those things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. This is what the early church did. They took care of themselves. They made sure none lacked. But what do we do today? The small way you get used to oppress the nearest Christian. And I keep saying this. You know, one of the commonest places we do this thing is after church. After church. After church, you, again, you get into your car and you generally drive away. Meanwhile, only you and your wife did motor, so the back seat is empty. And then God help you if you're driving a Sienna. So you can carry at least six people away from church. At least carry the red bus stop. But we don't. You just enter your motor and you drive away. As if the people who are now checking to the bus stop, they are not your brothers. But because you don't see them as you... You know what we say? We don't know who be thief. I don't know what kind of thief enters my motor in the name of our one help church member. So because of that, you then now not help your brother. And some of those people are going to check home. And then some of them may even be on the way to your own home. Which means you could have actually carried them home if you had just asked. I'm going to a better, anybody going to a better? And you know people going in that direction. They'll get free ride. But we are so scared now 
we call our brothers and sisters, but we treat them as if they are thieves. What does the Bible say? He says, whatever is done that is not of faith is what? Sin. So if you're not stopping that car to help somebody with a ride, you're not acting in faith. So you have sinned. So stop your motor by faith. Carry on saying it transport. Carry and go. Okay, let the person be thief. Now let's see we talked about the name of Jesus just now. I'll tell you a story quickly about I, I just remember this now now. My friend was coming from the airport. He went to pick his sister who had just come from the US. Sunday morning. He's coming from the airport with his sister. And then as the, you see that road behind Yabatek that enters Shomu. As he turned, he was living around that side. As he turned to enter that, as he on that road, he suddenly realized that a car had just overtaken him and the car did not speed off. The car overtook him and then balanced in front of him and refused to. If I, if I can overtake you, I'll leave you behind now, no matter. The car overtook him and then sat in front of him, obviously now blocking him because he cannot move. With reducing his own speed. Then another came and stayed beside him. So he was blocked by the side, he was blocked in front. At that point he realized something is up. And then they started motioning him that he should park. And then he realized a robbery is about to happen. So he opened fire. He took off, squeezed himself out of that place, came out from behind the car in front of him and opened fire in the car and took off. And they raced after him. And as they pursued him, they took their gun and they opened fire on his car. He's driving with his sister. They opened fire. They began to shoot at his bed. He said all that time, he, as he held the steering and marched the tattoo to the ground, he was just saying, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. And the car was tearing down. If you, if you know that road, it's a lonely stretch of road any time of the day. Not to talk of early morning around 8. He said, finally, one of the bullets destroyed his tire. So the car could no longer go. So he parked. So one of the thieves came to his driving driver's side and put the gun to his head and said, Shabu, you say you can run. Run now. Not be with this. You say you can run. He said he didn't even raise his head to answer the person. He just put his head on the steering and he was saying, Blood of Jesus. Blood of Jesus. Blood of Jesus. They, they are talking their own blood of Jesus. So he heard, Pah! The man shot at him. Nothing came out from the gun. He said he don't look, he continued, but he was watching the guy from the side. He continued his blood of Jesus. Blood. The man, knowing that he just shot this guy, nothing happened. He looked at his gun. What's going on here? He cocked it in again. He pointed it at him, shot it at him the second time. Nothing happened. Ah, the guy looked at the other car. He said, Omar, let's get out of here. But by that time, somebody from the other car had collected his sister's handbag. And added the dollar there. That's, they followed them from airport. And the dollar she came with inside her handbag. So they actually collected the dollar. But they were angry that he took off. Why you give us problem to collect this bag? They shot at him twice, nothing happened. So the, the name of Jesus, they walk home, really. Anyway, finally he got to the police station and made the official complaint and the DPO asked him, Oh boy, are you dead that motto? We heard the gunshots. Police don't come out. They heard the gunshots. They were shooting at his cars, they were racing on that. They were shooting at him. They said they heard the gunshots. So finally they came to carry the car. Bullet reading. I went, I went to his house the next morning, Monday morning. I went to his house on my own. I saw the car in his car. Bullet holes on the car. But not the two, the two lives were just the dollar that was lost. Now, when his boss heard the story, the boss said, Why are you living in that part of town? Hey, you come here. Go and get a house for me in the deck. So we got him a house in the deck. The next day, the guy don't build a house for the deck. So a testimony came out of it at the end of the day. All right, back to what we are saying. Acts chapter 4, 33 to 35. 1 Corinthians 12, 25 to 27, as we just read. 
you should not allow any part of your body to suffer. In this case, other Christians. We already read First Corinthians 12, 25 to 27. Go. Galatians 6, 10. Galatians 6, 10. Ephesians 2, 19. We are members of the same household. The Bible says. Ephesians 2, 19 says that we are members of the same household. How can you let somebody that you are... Okay, so after you have dealt with him outside, two of you are coming to live to sleep in the same house. How will you handle it? You let them beat them for outside. Two of you are coming to sleep in the same house. How are you going to... Because he's going to tell your parents that you were there when they were beating him and you did nothing. We are supposed to protect each other from any kind of harm, including pocket harm, that is brokerage, lack. He can't feed. He can't pay house rent. He can't pay school fees. In so far as you feed him, even if now only 10k, sir, or the uh, neighbor, I see that the children have not been going to school. I hope all is well. You never get money to pay. Sir, can I just drop this 10k? This is what I have. If I had more, at least you have helped. If they don't pay school fees, it's even possible that they don't feel bad for this evening. And that you take away your premium, what they're going to use to buy for this evening. Look, we just read it. Eh? Those who had, they brought what they had so that distribution could be made to everybody. So that there will be nobody lacking. There will be no you can't imagine somebody coming to church on Sunday and all he's thinking about is how you go to church this afternoon. And you are busy preaching one thing, you take say anointing for your body. The person you are talking to is thinking about how you go to church this afternoon. Okay, number three. Number three. Being sanctified by the Lord Jesus Christ, there are some things we can simply not be part of. Number three, living like other Gentiles. Living like other Gentiles. Scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, 17 to 32. Ephesians chapter 4, 17 to 32. Ephesians chapter 5, 1 to 7. All right, let's read. Ephesians chapter 4, 17 to 32. You see, the reason I'm making us read is because I need for us to see what the scripture actually says. So there's no confusion, there's no argument, there's nothing like I did not know. Bros. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you therefore walk, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. He is describing the unbeliever, the Gentile. He said, you should not be like them. Now, verse 19, he says, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness, so you cannot allow, you are not allowed to live in a lascivious manner. If you don't know the meaning of lascivious, well, you can Google it. But we'll come to that shortly. Who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness, then he explains it, to walk all uncleanness with greediness. To walk all uncleanness with greediness. We all generally know how unbelievers live. Paul is simply telling us, you cannot live like an unbeliever. We know how the average unbeliever lives. You can't live like that. To the unbeliever, everything goes so far I get what I want. You know, but I mean, no matter how I get the money, so far I get the money. To them, uh, what is it called? The end justifies the means. Another word that you can insert along with lasciviousness is debauchery. 
D E B A U C H E R Y. Devotion. They define themselves in the things which they do. So as I'm beginning to hear these days, in certain parts of Lagos, there are some things, even, even, even when I was in university, it had already started. You see Christians will gather and um, students will gather in the evening. Or whenever they, I don't know, I don't, I've never passed, I don't know. Whenever they did it, any, whatever time of the day. But they will gather in those places. Back in my own time, it was in the Kosovo village, beside the university. They will gather up themselves and they will start to play truth or dare. Truth or dare. And then when it gets to your turn, two people stand up, you and the other person. Whoever is asking the question or whatever, truth or dare, I dare you to kiss me. Or somebody, I dare you to kiss her. Sure? And you see the person that they are daring will get up and go and do it. Now they are getting a play that they play. Or you will say truth. They will ask you truth or dare. You say truth. So somebody will ask you a question. Did you sleep with your brother's wife? There's a game now. You have, you have said you, they should ask you a question about truth. So somebody knowing the circumstance may just ask you that kind of question. Did you cheat in your last exam? And you're supposed to answer with truth. Now you say me they ask you about truth. Or you may be there. They will dare you one thing now. Say this bottle of Ogogoro here now. Drink the whole bottle at once. I, I know they're still doing it today. Worse. Worse. I don't know what's happening in our universities, but I can imagine. Married people exchanging sexual uh, their, uh, uh, their partners in the name of phone. In the name of phone. I dare talk about that time. I remember one time I came to visit my friend. He was doing housemanship already in Lagos. So one of those evenings we were just relaxing in front of a, a, beer, a, beer, a beer place, not beer parlor, just that they the same beer there. And we just said among ourselves, let's see who can finish a bottle of beer. Let's see how fast you can finish a bottle. Which kind of play be that? And then you are supposed to raise that bottle to your mouth and don't bring it down until you finish it. So you do that thing now and your head knock. So what happens next? What happens next? Truth or I dare you, I dare you, you see that madam where they go chase her. I dare you, you see that madam where they go and just touch her from side. Huh? We are not supposed to live like that. Why are you looking at me one kind? Is it happening? I saw the eye that you used to look at me. Lawless, lascivious, debauchery, lawlessness. As if there are no restraints, there are no social expectations. You can just do anything you like. No, you cannot do anything you like. We are subject to the law of Christ. Which is, if the thing is not representing God, you are not supposed to be doing it. If the thing does not glorify God, it should not be anywhere near you. You should not even be there. You see, I, I don't know why we end up in such situations or why we allow it. Not that I don't know why. I'm talking about the Christian now. Something inside you should should revolt. Eh? And, and what's the English word? In English, they say, they so know you. You're going to do your one kind. And you don't want to be there. Disgust. Disgust. Yeah. Now, back in the day, before I opened the clinic, there was a house I used to visit every day because I was hoping that the man in the house would add to the money that I was looking for to start the clinic. So around 4, 5 p.m., they would start to come, they young men, they would start to come from different parts of, of this world. They would come to that flat. It was a duplex. They would come to that house. And then somebody would just announce, say, well, we we'll go to school now. Let's go to school. Let's go to school. You would think that they are going to Yabatek or Uniland. No, not that kind of school. They want to start gambling. When somebody announced, let's go to school, one pack of cards will just come out. Maybe the guy buy them as they come. They will gather at the dining table of the house, like six, seven, eight young men, able bodied young men. They will sit down there. Millions can be won and lost before 10 p.m. there. 
I was in that house because I was hoping that this man would give me money to join the local clinic. So I would sit there in the sitting room side, there at the dining table gambling, and I'm watching satellite TV. They're gambling. I know people who will join them, just that they don't come there, but I know. I now recognize some of the names that I used to hear at that table those days. They were the kingpins of 419, as it turned out. So the question then becomes, what if police come arrest them, any one of those evenings? What did I go tell my papa say I did do for day? Really? Is my father not supposed to be the, the law man in my house, in my, in my, in my life? I'm not, I'm not supposed to be accountable to him. What did I go tell my papa? Adult or no adult? What will you say? Because they will first of all pack all of you to police station. Those boys know what to do, they will bail themselves. Who is coming to bail you? The people that you are going to call, they, 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 they are going to wonder how you how. What did they do there? And then nobody will come. Because they are disgusted at the fact that your name is one day. I cannot send to go and call my man. Number four. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Have no fellowship with your fruitful works. I said we we're going to read Ephesians 4 17. Have no fellowship with your fruitful works of darkness. Don't even be part of it. Hey. Are you still with us? Have no fellowship. What is fellowship? What is the meaning of the word fellowship? Communion. What's the meaning of the word communion. What's the meaning of the word relationship? We are breaking it down step by step. What's the meaning of relationship? Huh? Somebody said something. I can't hear you. Frequent communication. Okay, fine. Anybody else? Huh? To mingle. To gatherness. In other words, they shouldn't even be your friend. Yes, you can relate because you're in the same class or you're in the same hostel, but they cannot be your friend. Because to be your friend means there will be times that you'll be spending with them. So what if that time that you're spending time with them, at that time the things start, truth or dare, and you're in the room? Let me tell you the truth. It will hurt you to come out there because you don't want to look like Shume. You know Shume? So I bet. Mugu. But in my time it was Shume. Call them Mugu now. You don't want to look odd, so you will sit down. Then you will bring out your Bible from your phone and say you are ready. Get out of there! Have no fellowship. Don't be there. Don't be found among them. There are some things we cannot permit because we are set apart. So if you are truly set apart, what do you do there? The moment the thing starts, you will know. Okay, you are sitting there. Okay, maybe you are sharing. You are you are doing homework together. Is that that's innocent enough? You are doing homework together. Maybe five or six of you. But among the five or six of you, maybe two are already in a romantic relationship. So one just kiss one now. Game don't start. Why are you still sitting down? Many of us will say, "Oh, I can handle it." I agree, you can handle it until. Police come and come, come back and say that yes, they do 419 for here. Because to be honest with you, any two people who can exhibit their romanticness or a romantic relationship publicly, I don't want to be near you. Now I'm a good person for trouble. You guys don't understand. I speak for myself. I born again. That thing is now disgusting to me. It's disgusting behavior. So sometimes I'm watching TV and I see, and I notice it's about to happen. In my brain, I switch off. Then I turn my eyes and look away. Or, since the remote is now available, I'm fast forward, come over there. Or change the channel, come over there. It's not as if I cannot imagine what is about to happen. Why should I be watching it? What are you doing there? 
Really? Have I not seen two footballers kiss each other? Man and man. I'm watching football. Maybe one of the score, he won't go celebrate with the guy. Toy. For public. But you see, if we preach this thing too deep, we will now have, soon ask ourselves a question. How are we going to change the world if we separate ourselves from the world? The Bible did not say separate yourself physically in that sense. But live in your head as being separate. Because tough na go into the same class. Tough na go into the same taxi. If you are inside taxi and they start, you can't run away. The car is moving. Really. And then if you now say, I'm going to physically separate myself. How are you going to preach to them? The issue is, have no fellowship with them. Have no relationship with them. Have no communion with them. Don't mingle with them. What's that word? Togetherness. Togetherness. Otherwise, how are they going to know that we are different? If we permit those things, we may not be doing them all, but you are permitting it. You know, when I was in secondary school, I noticed the hottest boys in my class, from, from class one, class two, class like that, the hottest boys in my class, of the whole of class one, they were Christians. The oldest among them was already like 16. So from him and all the rest of them, they were Christians. These boys were deep. Look, even inside your mouth, you get as you go be like you say, you just wash your mouth, finish. If you are a Christian, inside there will be a cleanness inside you, undefiled, pure inside you. So the day you engage that nonsense, you will start to feel defiled. You will start to feel dirty. These boys were like that. They, I felt one kind, and then they take first. These boys, they were at the top of the class. As if a spirit of excellence was working with them. I noticed. I wanted to be like them. But I did not want to be like them. But I noticed this guy is different. So one afternoon, I saw said, Lord Jesus, I noticed my classmates, they are different. And I suspect now you make them different. I see every evening they gather and they are doing their fellowship. I see, I hear them when they are talking about you. I see them sometimes when they are praying. I say, Lord, I want this. Come now. But because I still wanted to be guy man, I refuse to tell anybody that I told Jesus to come to me. So for 16 years, I lived as an unbeliever. For the next 16 years of my life, I lived as an unbeliever. The only thing I probably did not do was to go to burial ground and exhume a dead body. I didn't get them. All those who were at court, they all did such things. You see, like what you started to say from the beginning about this business of being sanctified, being made separate, and then she said, cleansed. Eh? And then he, he gave the example, if you wash your, if you get a, a set of dirty clothes and you wash one, eh? what's the relationship between the one that you are washed and the others? The word difference comes out. And once you don't wash one, even you won't put that one among the dirty ones by you, you won't do it. The Bible is saying, don't put your clean cloth and your dirty cloth together. Have no fellowship with dirty. You see this sanctification that happens to us in the Lord Jesus. After a while, it's like if you're just born again, after a while, you start to feel, you start to feel the cleanness inside you. Your voice, your voice is finished. Yeah, what is feelings? Yeah. Is that is that the what is feelings? Are you following? Are you are you following what I'm trying to set forth? You see, we don't even need to preach this thing, although it's clearly spelled out. We will soon read something now. It's spelled out in the Bible. We don't, you don't even need a preacher to say it. 
there's something you feel inside that should make you not want to be part of that thing. There's something inside that should immediately make you want to come up for there. It's called the Holy Ghost. It's called that new life that is inside you. That new life knows what it is and what it is not. What He knows. So if it is not happening to you, then I have to ask, are you born again? I have to ask, is that life inside you? Then for, let's say for people who have never lived as unbelievers, look at how you have felt from the beginning of your life to now. There is a feeling of difference that is inside you compared to your friends around you or your schoolmates. There's something, uh, this man said it one day, he said the people in his school, they don't have any home training. That's one word he used to describe the people he's seeing in his school, they don't have any home training. This thing that is inside us has to make you feel that difference because it, it, the, it, it is what is the difference. It's not something in your brain. It, okay, okay, let me explain this in another way. I know I said I was not going to preach. Let me explain this in another way. Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And the Bible says by this he was referring to the Holy Spirit that had not yet been given. Question, do you know what happens when you speak in tongues? And therefore, why you speak in tongues more frequently? He said, rivers of living water, life bearing or life giving water is what is inside your belly that comes out of your mouth when you are speaking in tongues. So this life giving water that is coming out of your mouth when you are speaking in tongues. Imagine that you put water in your mouth and then you start to talk. What's going to happen to that water? Some will shoot up as you are talking. Abi? Some will fall on top of your body and therefore on your clothes. Some will fall to the ground. Abi? That's three dimensions of effect. But this one is holy living water, not tap water. Eh? So this is your holy life-giving water coming out of your mouth. It goes into the atmosphere on top of you, or just into the air around you. What does it do? It's a holy water. It's a life-giving water. It gives life to your immediate environment. It changes your immediate atmosphere. So your, you and your atmosphere start to quarrel. Nobody has said anything to anybody. Just because you are speaking in tongues, your atmosphere will start to change. So if there are unbelievers in that atmosphere, they will start to dislike you. We will never even preach to them. There will be a difference and they will know, and you will know. They will know that there's something different about this guy. And that's why sometimes bullies bully the people they bully. Because they know there's a difference. Realize that this guy is weak. So they go and bully the guy. Unbelievers know that we are different. Unbelievers know that we won't do some of the things they do. So they know that we are not going to fight back, so they, they, they attempt to oppress us. They know that there's something about this guy that is not like us. They know. <coughs> they know. <coughs> In my born again state, I, at Obalende, I went to fetch water from a public tap. You know the meaning of public tap? Public tap. The people on this side may know the meaning of public tap. The people on this side may never know the meaning of public tap. Public tap. The ground of the public tap is green. You make mistake, you will slip and fall down because of the that green part of the ground you will fall down. Dirty environment, but public tap. Government public tap. So we are in a queue. I'm there with them. This is 1995, not uh, not uh, 1970. 1995. We're in a queue. I'm waiting for my turn. I, I had uh, a Derek can with me. And this young man, can't be more than like 20 years. This young media boy, this young man, he just came from nowhere. He had a foolish jerry can with him. He just came from nowhere, he just went straight to the top of the line. He just plugged his jerry can to the mouth of the tab and started fetching water. Uh, I looked at the guy. This is around 10 on Saturday morning. I looked at the guy and I addressed him. I said, Mr. Man, those of us who are there for line, you think we're fools? You know, since people are there for line before you do that, the guy looked at me. He looked up. He was waiting for his jerry can to be full. After the can don't fool, he don't make sure, say, he don't fetch water. Then he turned to me. He said, uh, well, you know that they are the area boy for us. I said, I'm talking to you. You think that the rest of us, the Chris, we stand for line? Or me and you, not mate, I'm standing on the line. Why can't you go and stand on He said, uh, uh, Mr. Man, I go dirty you for here. 
Why is he why is he threatening me with the thing? Because he can see that I'm clean. I'm not wearing a suit. This is Saturday morning. Who they wear suit on Saturday? I just came from the house to fetch water, so I'm wearing ordinary house clothes. He said, "I go dirty you." He said, "He bent down to pick some dirt so that he can throw it on your body." Why is he threatening me with that? Because he knows that I'm not like him. I'm not dirty like him. He knows. What's the problem? Eh? So you don't get my point. He knows that I will not be able to handle it if he stay in me. He can handle it because that is his lifestyle. He's an area boy. He's down there on the street. He knows I will not get into a street fight with him. Looking at me, he knows. Oil is dripping from my face. Freshly shaved, not be like now. He knows that this person no go fight him for this street. I can't afford to. He is ready. He fights every day. He sleeps inside bus. He no get half. He sleeps inside bus when they pack for him. So he's threatening me with his own level of life, knowing that I will not get down there. Too. Clean man versus clean man. He will not be telling me he want to do the my body. At worst, boxing match. I don't know what boxing now. I'm learning some skills of boxing. I'm learning some of their moves. As if I will ever allow myself to get into a fight. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Without even knowing scripture, if you born again and that life is inside you, there is a pureness. I don't want to say purity. No, 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 that's English. There's a pureness that is inside. It comes from inside, not your brain. There's a pureness inside you. Once you do something wrong, it will start to feel defiled. It will tell you that you have done something contrary to its nature. That's not part of you. A gentleman was playing football, 1996. He was playing football. Football. During football, they will jack you now. Somebody will give you stud, you fall down, they will play you rough. Football. It's a contact sport. He's playing football. And somebody jacked him. He looked at the guy, eh, he it is you tough. He waited for the next point of contact between him and the guy. He jacked the guy back. He said, he, he said, the, he came to me. I was waiting for him in his house as they were playing football. A few minutes later, he came to me. He came home, he came to meet me now. I said, I don't play things, don't play things. He said, actually, he, he gave down finish. I said, what happened? He said that as he jacked that guy back, in today's football, they'll give you red card for jacking back. So even the world don't catch up. Eh? If you retaliate, they'll give you red card. He said, as he jacked the guy back, he said something inside him began to feel naked. He began to, something inside, he couldn't explain it. The moment he said, I said, I know what it is, you lost your inner peace. Because the Spirit of God in you said, No! You can't do that. We don't jack back. We don't take vengeance. We don't retaliate. That's what believers. He do you the thing, you smile, and you say, Praise the Lord. If you can continue playing, you continue playing. If you can't continue playing, get out of there. After all, playing football is not taking you to heaven. It's just going to give you some money in the bank if you are playing for a Saudi club. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Get out of there! Before you imbibe that spirit of I will do you back. Come over there. Do not have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. What are the unfruitful works of darkness? The things which cannot glorify Christ. They cannot be fruitful in the direction of Christ because they don't belong to light. Since you say darkness, let's take it as darkness. All those things what will they do with the dark? Those things that you do that you shame no will let you come to and where everybody will see you. They are works of the darkness. Simple. All the things you do that you must hide to, they are of the dark. Anything that you do that you have to hide to, that you have to lock down, make sure it's in you there inside to do unfruitful works. Anything that you do, you look left or right to make sure nobody they look you before you do unfruitful work. Ah. I remember a young boy from a long time ago, a long, young boy. Young boy. His mother had just come from work, she did night duty. So they all came out to receive mommy as his crew. It's around 7.30ish, before 8 o'clock. 
As they came downstairs to receive Nomo, there's a shop beside where they are receiving Nomo. The woman is selling you know, small, small things, provision, sweets, biscuits, all those things. So the small boy, yeah, biscuit, the uh, sweet, enter in high. The rest of his siblings, they are welcoming mommy. Oh, mommy, welcome, 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 welcome. So the first move, he used his hand to brush one fly away from the, the sweet. So anybody watching him would think that he did dry fly. By the time he brushed the fly away, the next time he don't collect the sweet. But somebody at the first floor of the building, where they are at the ground floor, saw him as he collected the sweet. So from up there, the guy shouted his name. And then we got the tongue, what is it? He said, it just takes sweet. Why did you need to look left or right before you take the sweet? Something inside you is already telling you, not if you want if so. You are about to do something that you know. We know the works of darkness. We know without any preacher telling us. Something in you will make you want to hide to do it. You shouldn't be part of it. When you want to cheat in the exam class, why do you first of all look to check where you visited today? You know you're about to do something you shouldn't do. Even to ask your mate for pencil or eraser, eh? you first make sure that you visit on the look. Why? Because you know the rules are against even talking with another person. This is my exam. Every time you have to look left or right to make sure nobody can see you, you are about to steal. Or you are about to do something that is... What did Jesus say? He said they don't come to the light because they know that they are works of the dark. So they don't want to come to the light because they don't want what they do to be exposed. They don't want people to know what they do. That cannot be good. If you are living your Christian life, you want everybody to know because there's nothing to hide. This is a good life. Is, they're doing good. Okay, let's read Ephesians chapter 4 from Timothy. I promise that we will read plenty of scripture. Let's read scripture. Ephesians 4 from verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, debauchery, on uh, uh, lawlessness, to walk all on cleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. Notice that verse 20. But you have not so learned Christ. 21. If so be that you have heard of him and you have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now verse 25. Wherefore, Putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So how can you be lying to your Christian brother? 26. Be ye angry and sin not. Let the sun, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. 27. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give him that needed. 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that he may minister grace unto the hell. 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. It's a pretty long read. But for some of us, we refuse to read the Bible, so we use this opportunity to read the Bible. So you see what is there. The prescription is clearly written. What is expected of us. What you can do, what you cannot do. Now in the business of have no fellowship with your fruitful work of darkness, I was going to read Ephesians chapter 5 anyway, but how down do we read from Ephesians chapter 5? Uh, Ephesians 5, 
I was only reading 1 to 7 before. Now we start from 11 to 25. How do we read Ephesians 5 from 1 to 21 now? Our time is almost up. Ephesians 5, 11 to 21. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. 2 Corinthians 11, 16 to 22. Ephesians 5, 11 to 21. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 18. 1 Corinthians 11, 16 to 22. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. How can you say because they are your friends and you follow them to forward? Or you help them go buy food while they are doing it on the computer? Or now you help them go drop a letter for post office? When you know what they are, what those letters are about. I mean, you shouldn't be part of it. You cannot do what they do. Really. You see this work you have been doing in the last couple of weeks? There are people who have made hundreds of thousands because they are natural. You know how they do it? Inflation of a contract figure. So God told my friend's boss, tell all your workers not to do any deal with government officials. God told the man, I'm giving you this contract because I want to give you this contract. You tell your workers not to do deal with any government. You know what they do? My people used to supply banks of what they sell. So they supply to government. So if you go to government and you supply the local government with let's say 50 banks, when they want to write the paper, they will ask me, what will we write? So they will write 500 bags, but you actually supplied 50. So those 450 extra bags, you are going to give them the money of 50 bags. That's their own corruption, bribe. Then they will write 50 bags for you. So government will pay you for 50 bags, or you only supply them. Government will pay you for 500 bags, or you only supply 50 bags. So my friend said his boss warned all of them, don't do that thing. If you supply 50 bags, let them write 50 bags on your paper. Don't give anybody money. Don't let anybody inflate the thing that you have written. Uh, when I was in train, my fellow Osha, he said he, 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 he is a Saliba man. He sells at the market in Lagos Island. He said uh, one time somebody came to buy goods. At least, so you know when this thing started, that somebody has done this thing has started. You finish buying, they will bring out the receipt book. You want to write your receipt. And then he said, this man asked him. He said, so he said, so he said this man asked him, so what should I write on your receipt? My fellow Pasha, he went, he was the one who went to buy. He said, the person selling asked him, what thing I go write for receipt? So he told the man, what do you mean by what you go write? What thing I buy? Don't be fine, I buy. Write fine there. How much you sell him? 11 naira. Write the 11 naira there. Why is the seller asking him, what thing I go write for receipt? You see where the thing comes from? Because if you tell the man, right, that I bought it 23 naira, he will write in that receipt 23 naira. Eh? You will go to the office, collect the 23 naira from the office, but now 11 naira you pay. You have just made how much? Put that as millions of naira. Who was asking me these questions yesterday? How do they make this money? Okay, okay, no. How do these people make this money? This is how. So a petrol marketer brings one shipload of fuel to the wharf, to the port. He discharges one shipload, whatever number of liters he, he discharges it. No, he doesn't discharge it, he brings it to the port. The harbor master marks it for him. He don't bring one ship, 40 tons. He marks it on the port. They take that ship, they drive the ship away, bring it back tomorrow morning. The harbor master marks it for him. He brings another ship. He brings one ship yesterday, they don't bring another ship today. It's the same ship. They mark it for him, another 40 tons. He drives the ship away, it brings it back the third day, they mark it for him the third time. After they don't do it like five times, they will now discharge it inside the tank. So federal government will pay that marketer five times for what he did only once. And the Bible says, don't be part of that. Don't be part of that. Don't do that. They send you a message, you bought it 50 naira, come back and say, oh God, I bought it 50 naira. Your change is 3 naira 50 kobo. That's your change. Allow Oga to dash you the money by himself. I'm 
many of us will tell you we'll leave it on the table. My friend said that that money on the table, he doesn't he said he doesn't put any money. He told me this in 1996. He said he does not put any money that is not hundred naira in his pocket. 1996. So when the people print change, he will tell them leave it on the table. At closing, as they are coming to tell him, oh, that good night, oh, that good night, it's from that table he will be telling them, take for your transport, take for your transport. He said, no, they put that kind of money for your pocket. Never. It's a rule. He also said, I don't get anywhere sweaty. So the AC in my car must be working. Because he knows the effect. If you arrive there sweating, they will downgrade you. From 20,000, your price will go to 2,000. Because you pay them sweating. It's unfortunate, that's why it don't be part of it. If change day, tell the man say change day. Mm -mm. Hold it, stretch it to himself. I see your change. Let him say, oh no no no, keep that. You can have it. Not that you don't go bring change. It's not your right to pocket the change. Some people have even spent the change before they get to you. When my change, I say, oh God, I'll be hungry for it. Like thief. The Christian should not be the one to that. No. No. You have already been taken care of in the supply of God in Christ. You may not know yet, but God has already provided for you. Don't be part of it. Unfortunately, you see the pressure. Your mates who are doing it, they will buy a house, they will buy a car, they will build a house on Banana Island. They will be driving big, big car. They will be laughing at you, saying you still be tenant with them, don't be landlord. That is the pressure that makes people do these things. And then before you know what's happening, a Christian has joined them. Number five. Things that we must not admit, we must not be caught being involved in. Do not be among the company, don't be among the group of people who cause division in the church. Don't be among the group of people who cause division among the body of Christ. Do not be among those who cause division among the body of Christ. Remember, we read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 earlier, which says that we are all members of the same body. If you cause division in the church, you are cutting the hand away from the body, and you are telling the hand to go and stand by itself. And then you cut the leg, come out, so you go stand by itself. You are dismembering the body. Anybody read the book called The Secret Place? The Secret Place. It's a book called The Secret Place, a black colored book called The Secret Place. In that book, the man described a vision that the Lord showed him. He said in the vision, he was walking down the road, and, the, and as he passed by, he saw what clearly was a human hand, only the human hand, nobody, just the human hand standing by the roadside there, the corner. He said he continued walking, small time, he saw what clearly was the tongue. He gave one corner there, the tongue removed somebody's tongue, put on the ground. He said he continued walking, he saw another one, blessing and leave her with that. He said by the time he got to the end of the road, he saw human parts scattered on both sides of the road. It's a vision. He said, so, he said, Lord, what is this? And he said, the Lord said to him, that is what you people have done to my body. That is what you people have done to my body. I'm not the one saying it now, so when I speak to this language, I'm not the one saying it. It's there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, which we started to read just now, we didn't read chapter 3. 1 Corinthians, it says, there should not be divisions among you. Don't come and be saying, I'm of Paul, you are of Apollos. You say, I'm, we are redeemed, we are chosen, I am of <laughs> We should not be talking like that. I'm, I'm redeemed. No, in redeemed, we don't shut up. What is the standard for all of the church? It's inside me. So don't say, in our church, we don't do that. Eh, eh, eh. All these things cause division. Back in the day, I used to hear things like Igbo church, Yoruba church. Eh? So they don't even, for Igbo church, they don't invite Yoruba preacher. For God's sake! Using those two words to describe church is already division. Because church has no Igbo or Yoruba or Hausa or Ibibio or Efik. There's no Jew or Gentile in the church. We are simply the elect of God fellow citizens with the saints. What was the word you used just now? Called of God. The church of God. Sanctified in Jesus Christ. That's what we are. No matter where you come. 
So if you have to describe another part of the body of Christ with any adjective other than the ones used in the Bible, you are causing division. You are causing division. He said, don't be part of that thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 8, 12 to 18, we're 28, we already read it. Romans 16, 17 and 18, let's see this one. Romans chapter 16, verses 17 to 18, just two verses, quick, 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 quick. Our time is far spent, in fact, we're out of time. Romans 16, 17 to 18. Are we there? Quickly, quickly. Are we there? Now I beseech you, brethren. See, I'm brethren. Church. I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good works and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Mark them with confusion and avoid them. First Corinthians chapter three, one to eight. Those of you writing scripture, First Corinthians chapter three, one to eight. That's where it talks about. Don't be saying, "I am of redeem. I am this. I am a chosen. I am deeper life. I am a." Hey. We are first and foremost Christians, the chosen of God, called as elect, sanctified in Christ, the church of God, the saints. That's what we are. That's what the Bible used to describe us. We cannot afford to be described by it. If you do it, you are now causing division. And the Bible says to mark the people who do that thing and avoid them because they are not serving Jesus. They are serving their own belly. That is, they are working for their own advantage. I'm not the one causing the division. The scripture is not the one causing the division. You say avoid those people. If you avoid somebody, what's that? No, they don't divide with that. You say they are not serving Jesus. They are serving themselves. Avoid them. Okay, for the sake of to finish, let me move on. Huh? Let me move on. Number six. Let no one seek his own. Let no one seek his own. Don't be self-serving. You are a member of a body. Remember to help other people. Remember to work for the good of other people. Do not be self-serving. 1 Corinthians 11, 24 to 33. All the scriptures I'm giving you, you can go and read them later. This is for our own edification. This is for our own benefit. We don't have the time to read all of them one by one. Let no one seek just his own benefit or his own advantage. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Romans chapter 14 from verse 7 to 23. Now the last one, and then we can go. Last, 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 test, last. I should have said this one first. Number seven. Anything that we distract from Christ, distract or detract, Anything that will cause people to turn from Christ or anything that we remove from the image of Christ. Anything that we detract from Christ. Now, the way to get about this, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, and then Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. Colossians 2, verse 6, Ephesians 4, 20. Titus 2, 11 to 15. Let me explain this quickly and then we can go. You should not permit anything that will distract people from Christ or anything that we detract, that is subtract from Christ. We should not permit it. 
and of course you certainly must not be part of doing it. Now Colossians 2 verse 6 says, the way you have learned Christ, that is how you are to continue in Him. The question then becomes, how did you learn Christ? Then Ephesians chapter 4 verse 20, when we were reading just now, I said note this verse. Ephesians 4 20 says, for you have not so learned Christ. Putting emphasis on how you learned Christ. What have you learned from Christ? He said that is how you are to continue. How did you learn Christ? What is your general impression? What is your general image about Christ? Or to be a born again Christian? I mean, somewhere at the back of your head, we all know it. We cannot see. I mean, something like that. We cannot be part of any nonsense. We know it now. Really. That is our so that is how most of us have learned Christ. Holy. I mean, as an example, I'm saying. So if you have such an image of Christ, for example, then that is how you are to continue in him. So anything that does not or that seems to, 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 to reduce your image of Christ, the one that you have, you should not allow it. So if all along in your life you have known being a Christian means you don't participate in sin. So if you are there, for example, and uh, how will I put it now? I don't even know what example to do. Some, somebody starts to rob his neighbor. Or, or if you are male and a woman starts to undress herself in public. Or the other way around, a man starts to misbehave. That does not match your, 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 your knowledge of Christ that is in your head. It does not match it. So what, you should, what should you be doing at that point in time? You should be walking away. You should be walking away. Um, six years ago, I think, exactly, six years ago. We were coming from Uba. Yeah. We were coming from Uba. And I just looked across the road that we were about to go and pass now. And I saw this young, clearly young woman. Young woman. Not more than maybe 30. Young woman. He just started to craze. He better say just pulling cloth finish for corner. He just naked finish. Just the craze just is she's still clean, fresh. He just naked. I saw her from afar and I knew that that boss was going to pass by herself. From there, afar. My face. I was weeping inside. Why? I can't come down from the bus to do anything. It's a naked woman, number one. The bus is moving, number two. If I come down, I miss my trip to Lagos. We're coming to Lagos. That early morning. We slept in the bus. But there were people around her standing there with her. As if in a normal thing. To see a young, fresh body, not wrinkled, dirty body, where you go say don't the Christians. This is fresh. I turned because I know that by the time the boss gets to her, we're going to turn in front of her, and I'm seeing back now. I don't want to see front. So I turned. But I've also been there. I've also been there. Another naked woman. You know what the women around her did? They removed their apa. What's wrong with us? They removed their apart, they went to cover that woman. And I'm wondering inside that vehicle. I, I can't come down for oh, yes, I could have come down and you lose your transport, Trek go Lagos. But I, I can't go with you to cover and I, I will now see what I don't want to see. So I didn't come down. You can take me to the judge and go and whip me 12 lashes for not doing anything. Okay, I accept. But I'm talking more about the people who were on the ground. You know how many times these things are, they, they happen to me in my mind? Say if that can't happen to my presence, what are you going to do? This is why every day before I leave the house, I must wear vests under my shirt. So that if I have to remove my shirt to cover that person, he will let me do. And I will be naked. And I will wear vest all off. But I will move my shirt and put it on that person. Why? That person is not supposed to be naked. It offends something inside me when I see certain things, especially the suffering of another person. It's just that many times I can't immediately do anything. There are some things we should not permit. 
How, what, what is the image of Christ that you see? A helper, Abi? A helping person. I imagine if the Christ is on a bus, for example, don't be all doing one like this. God would not appear for doing one body. You know, I'm just talking. Did he not do it? I mean, physically, every person you saw like that, he took care of their problem. There are some things we simply cannot permit if we are the called of God. That's the point we are seeking to make. And which is why I'm imploring you, and this is why I gave you all those scriptures. Please go and read them. So that even if you cannot decode when your spirit is giving you signal that that thing should not be happening near you, well, when you read it, you will see it in the Bible, so that when it's happening, you will know that you shouldn't be part of that, or you shouldn't let it happen. Defend your neighbor, especially if he's of the household of God. That's what scripture says. Especially if he's a Christian. I'm not the one who wrote that in the Bible. It's there. Especially if he is of the household of God. Make sure that person does not suffer. It's our responsibility. But I'm also saying there's a driving force from inside every one of us that should be active enough to alert or warn us about what is right and what is wrong without using it for a book. Something inside you. There's an internal program. What do you call it? Default setting. It's called the spirit. Inside every one of us. We must be sensitive enough to recognize that thing so that you walk away before you offend in Christ. We are the sanctified of God. That sanctification must show in our difference. In our difference. And somebody will notice and they will say, this one is a Christian. This one is a Christian. It's not part of them. It's a Christian. If I say this one, I somebody I'm talking about myself. When I was in the desert, the chief of secret police in that part of the, in Nigeria, in that state in Nigeria, he came to meet me where we were living. One early morning. I don't know if it's not secret police. I just know he's just an Arab man. And he asked me, he said, What do you do in Nigeria? I looked at him. I can't tell him I'm a pastor. I mean, I am in Muslim tradition. I said, uh, I'm a doctor. And then he said, you, doctor. Meaning, if you be doctor, what do you need to do for this place? Because It was after he left that they told me that he is the head of secret police. So he was doing his job as secret police. And then he told them in Arabic why he was asking the question. And the reason he asked me that is because I not be like them. He knows what in them be. They decide cocaine, they decide passport, all of them, they do a carry a shower. He could see that this guy not be like them. I don't know what he saw, but that's why he approached me. The next thing he asked me if I could cut his hair. He gave me his own, you go ahead to cut, and I spoil him. Because I don't have a go ahead. I spoil him. He was very angry. But why did he trust me with his hair? He could see that this guy is something different. I know I'm talking about myself, but he got to be so. I don't know what he saw already, but he's got to be so. He said they were called Christians the first time in Antioch. Why? They could see that these ones are followers of Christ. They're different. If they can't recognize your difference, then there's a problem. If they can't recognize your difference, then there's a problem. Supposed to be separate, set apart, sanctified in Christ. 